Now, I'd like to welcome to the stage Shafika Kapalwak. She's the director of the Masarwar Foundation and Wesley College and poetess. She's going to open us for a special piece on peace and conflict. Welcome. Good morning. <clears throat> I wrote this poem. I am from Afghanistan, just to give you a background. Uh, and I wrote this poem in 2019. It was translated by Khwaga Kakar and Irshad Ahmadi into English. <clears throat> Don't go to war. What is it in a war? Blinded eyes, collapsing innocent hearts, seeing black Stones, sparrows falling down, killing tulips, scorched vessel, trembling green leaves, germinating thrones, don't go to war. What is it in a war? Don't go to war, you will not bear it. A red book is burned in a war. A black pen is broken in a war. A white boy is charcoaled in a war. A virgin melody is mute in a war. People become mad in a war, ravaging themselves or the hearts of others. Graveyards are their courtyards. In the dancing wild wind, they hold candles. Don't go to war. War awakens a dragon. Poison spewing from his mouth blood dripping from his evil eyes. So long are his paws, so sharp are his teeth, chewing the wings of a baby swallows, biting the birthmarks of elderly women, bleakening the foothills of the motherland, raining in bursts over the forest, showering the rivers with red blood. Don't go to war. What is it in a war? but a dragon. Devastation floods his veins. Fairies are his prisoners. He's busy devouring human bones, his hungry mouth swallowing them one after another. Black smoke pouring from his breath, polluting the fresh ear. This shadowless dragon is incomplete. So he strives to set the tall trees of the motherland ablaze. This dragon hates the light. So he strives to burn the stars, stars, stars to ashes. This dragon who descended from the keen of darkness burns the golden flakes of light, ex extinguishes the sun's rays, in the full darkness of the night, he rips the shawl of the motherland, devours her wounded body, leaving only a few remains. If you go, you will find the dragon in the war. Once his bestial paws touch you, then you too will slaughter the motherland, then you too will become unstable, then you too will kill the tulips, then you too will suck the wings of the sparrows. You too turn the clear waters into dark mirrors, force flowers of love to sleep on rocks. Then you too will, will stand in front of the sun, depriving hearts of light. Then you too will turn the flowering, the flowing rivers into red blood, rob the fields of their harvest, crush revolting minds with slavery, steal new thoughts from the layers of our hearts. Don't go to war. What is it in a war? Blinded eyes, collapsing innocent hearts, seeing black stones, spar sparrows falling down, killing tulips, scorched vessel, trembling green leaves, germinating thrones. Don't go to war. What is it? in the war. Thank you. Uh, thank you. The white, the white guy is not because of the skin, but in Islamic civilization, it is the symbol of light, so internal beauty, and also the red book refers to Quran. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Shafika, for that powerful art and poem. I'd like to now introduce our next session, our first panel on peace and conflict resolution, women at the front line. It's no secret, and I'm sure everyone in this room knows, that war and conflicts often act as amplifiers for inequity, especially for women. If we just look at Russia's recent invasion of Ukraine, according to the UN Women and Care International, 90% of the 5.5 million refugees are women. 60% of the 7.7 .7 million people internally displaced in Ukraine are women. Those are big numbers. However, women are not just survivors, they're also the people creating the solution. So this panel will look at war and peace and conflict and resolution to discuss all of this. So I want to welcome to the stage Milan Verveer. She's executive director of the Georgetown Institute for Women, Peace and Security at Georgetown University, and all of the panelists who she will introduce. Let's give them a round of applause. Well, good morning, everyone. You're a wonderful sight. Uh, it's always such a pleasure for me to be back at Vital Voices. I spent eight years of my life here with Elise building this organization and with so many others. And it's, it's just awesome uh, to be in the building. <clears throat> and uh, I also want to say that it's particularly special to be here at the Women's Forum USA because back at the beginning of the Women's Forum, when they used to meet in Deauville in France in 2005, Elise and I were there, and I think we were there for many, many years after, and Diane von Furstenberg, who it's lovely to see you, Diane, uh, she was with us for an extraordinary evening there as well. So it is, pardon me? It was, a, it, that's true in seven. So it's a reunion of sorts. Um, but today, uh, we are going to talk about the role of women in peace building, in negotiations, in relief, recovery, in building democracies. Uh, in so many ways, as you heard, women do bear the brunt of war. But as a woman said to me one night in Kabul in Afghanistan, stop looking at us as victims and look at us as the leaders that we are. And we are here on this stage with two remarkable leaders. Um, <clears throat> they have been on the front lines uh, in their countries fighting against violence. Attacks on women are, have been a constant, uh, mired in the challenges that conflict and opposition represents, and really being leaders in every way. And I just want to give a shout out to Shafika because um, she's extraordinary in her in her way and what she does. Uh, you heard the beautiful poem, but we were talking earlier um, about the situation in Afghanistan today, uh, and it is heartbreaking in every way what's happening there, um, in, and particularly to women who are being erased uh, as we sit here. That is the goal of the Taliban. So I want to start this morning uh, with uh, Musakua. She... Uh, she has been with Vital Voices as long as I can remember, um, being one of those exemplary leaders that we have worked with and spotlighted over the years. Uh, she's a Cambodian politician. She was a member of parliament, a rights activist. She served as the Minister of Women, um, a leader in the opposition. She went up against the Cambodian strongman who is still there, Hun Sen, and just to give you a flavor of what he is like, he said this, I only weaken the opposition. I'm going to make them dead. And if anyone is strong enough to try to hold a demonstration, I will beat the dogs and put them in a cage. She was the opposition in many ways. And she went up against the strong man time and time again. And of course, she's in exile now, as too often happens. You have to get away from these people before they do worse to you. Uh, but 
Sakula, your story is just extraordinary, and we've been really privileged to be able to work with you over the years. Talk about um, what it's been like, um, the struggle for democracy in Cambodia, about the most significant moments and challenges, so that our wonderful audience can understand what it's like to take on this kind of cause. Before I talk about it, I wish to say how inspired I am coming back to Write the Voices, to the Women's Forum, and Ambassador Vivia. We have been on this journey for a long time, and it is much, much longer ahead of us. And this forum is very, very meaningful to me at this moment, to my sister Kim Hoon, my Cambodian sister Kim Hoon, who is with us, who is now part of Vital Voices. <laughs> Ambassador Vivian, you asked me, how do I survive, right? And the strong man, the Prime Minister of Cambodia, the illegitimate Prime Minister of Cambodia, just said, I will destroy the opposition, whatever it takes. I want them dead. And I want you all to come to the State Department this Friday at 10.30, because the Cambodian diaspora, especially the women, and the women from Myanmar, from Hong Kong, will come together to say to this illegitimate prime minister, we, you, we will never be dead because of you. We will die for our country, for our women, for democracy. And we want you behind bars. So please come to this rally with us at State Department on, the, on this Friday. She um, never stops. <laughs> as, as long as I've known democracy her, she's never been in stops. These rallies. <laughs> um, you know, genocide. Uh, was over, genocide in Cambodia was over 40 years ago. My, my parents died, over two million Cambodians died in less than four years. That was 40 years ago. Armed conflict, over, that was 40 years ago. No more landmines, few landmines left, over 40 years ago. But does it mean that there is peace in Cambodia? No, no. No war doesn't mean there's peace. There's peace only, only when we can do the following. When women can go to school. And if there is no school for women, how do you raise a nation? How do you raise the whole world? The, when there is corruption, there is no peace. When there is corruption, who's the first, who is the first one to be sold to human trafficking? Who's the first ones to be raped, to be tortured? Women, young girls. So to us, it is essential that we continue this fight. And I want to say that Cambodia is forgotten because of Ukraine and Myanmar and all the wars around. But I don't think it should be forgotten because democracy, when it is attacked anywhere, democracy is attacked everywhere. And that's why it is important to bring democracy to the middle of the table when we talk about peace. Peace, that's when the big guys talk about peace. They talk about no more, if they can, no more weapons and all that. No, peace starts at the grassroots level. And this is what we are doing at this moment. Going back to, to the grassroots and reconnecting, reconnecting, continue to connect with women at the grassroots. To talk about who am I as a woman? What does it mean to be a woman? It starts by being nourished in the belly, in the belly, to have the right to be born and to be free and to have the right to make your own choice. And to women, when we make choice, a choice, it's not about us. 
when we make a choice, and we always have to make a choice. You wake up in the morning, you have to make a choice. If there is corruption and you are poor, that choice is between feet. Feeding your family three meals, two meals, one meal, or no meal at all. It has to stop. This war against women has to stop. And it goes down to corruption. It goes down to feeding the pockets of the autocrats, of these corrupt leaders who remain at the uh, global stage. We cannot accept to have them travel the world when they kill their own people in their own countries. So thank you, uh, Sakua. We'll come back to you. Uh, and then we'll take audience questions for as long as we have time as well. So think about what you might want to ask. Mukadesa Yurish was a former deputy minister for commerce and industry of the Islamic Republic of Afghanistan. That was before the Taliban seized power and stormed into Kabul. And her life, uh, like so many others at that moment, was thrown into turmoil. And like Shafika, she had to go into exile. She was evacuated. Um, and had to leave so much behind um, except for what she could put on her back uh, as, she, uh, as she left in haste. Because as a woman who was a leader in Afghanistan, not only a leader, but an economist, someone skilled at business, someone who was in the ministry doing this work in a place that was not always easy for a, a woman to, to excel, particularly uh, in this field. Um, and today she is a professor at George Washington University uh, and uh, being able to exchange her skill set with, with the students there. Um, I think this is the third day in a row I'm on a panel with Mukadesa. She has been sharing her experiences um, with audiences and just an extraordinary person. So I hope Mukadesa, you can not only tell us a little bit about the struggle in Afghanistan when you were there, because as, as um, you just heard from Sakua, it wasn't always easy in these situations, but what is happening today? Thank you, Ambassador. Um, I first want to say uh, it's an honor always to be here. And at least as I was, I wanted to to you and Diane, as I was coming here, I got off the metro, I looked at my watch and I realized I need to catch an Uber to get here. So I sat in this Uber and the guy told me, he asked me, what is this place you're going to? I told him it's a global embassy for women. Um, and he you know, almost turned back and said, I have never heard of that. Men don't get to have an embassy. So, uh, and it was very interesting. So um, I think I, just being here, at least I want to thank you, Diane, and all colleagues who have been involved for such a long time with Vital Voices. It indeed is a special place. And when we got here, he got off and took a picture of it. And he said, this is very, <laughs> you know, I've never heard. So uh, I actually didn't ask him that. But he, uh, yeah, he, he was quite surprised that just hearing that women have a global embassy he said men don't have one yeah so the power of women um ambassador Verville, um thank you so much for you know giving a little bit of a background um uh i was in afghanistan i've, I've been born um in afghanistan i was raised there but i think Post 9-11, uh, when the international community arrived in Afghanistan and the Taliban regime back then was toppled, um, it certainly provided a lot of opportunities. Uh, it opened up spaces for women uh, to be able to first go back to school, but also you know, to come forward and be part of the public life. So I certainly um, invested in those opportunities, not only myself, but my family. And then um, when... The Taliban arrived back in Kabul 2021. By then, 
Um, I had a long career in the government. Um, it was a tough job because we were trying to build institutions um, in the middle of a war. Um, so Taliban was clearly an opposition at that point, but I think it wasn't just the Taliban. Uh, as a woman, uh, we had to push so many social boundaries on a daily basis, and not because, you know, Afghanistan is a country that doesn't necessarily accept, uh, it's a patriarchal country, doesn't necessarily um, accept a woman leader. But I think it's also because we have been affected by war for such a long time that it does affect the fabric of the society in a way um, that it makes it difficult for women to exist. Um, I think those five years of the first Taliban regime uh, essentially erased women from the public life. And you, do, you don't really realize what, type, what sort of an impact it has once you put women back in the society and then you start seeing that everybody sees them as an alien. Um, I remember walking, when I first joined the government, walking into meetings and my colleagues just treated me like an alien from some other place who needs to be treated specially because they just didn't know how to engage with me. Um, so I think it wasn't just, as a woman, it wasn't just the opposition. The Taliban clearly, I don't fit their ideology, but I think it was also just the society in general and how war impacts uh, the fabric of the society. So I think peace for me is... Um, um, it's a state of mind, actually. You know, peace can mean so much for so many different people. Um, right now, the level of um, armed conflict in Afghanistan has certainly reduced uh, because the Taliban are not actively creating violence as they were uh, in the past 20 years, but that does not mean peace for the people of Afghanistan. Uh, I think I very much agree with you when you say peace is when women can go back to school, you know, so I think we have to be very careful with how we define peace, how we perceive peace, um, the, the, and also the peace for one section of the society doesn't necessarily always mean peace um, um, for everybody. And I also just want to say one final thing, you know, that um, leaving home and having your advocacy platform being taken away from you is also a form of violence. Um, that people don't really talk, uh, it doesn't really get talked about, but I think what, the suffering that I go through on a daily basis here, while knowing what's going on back home, you know, and the women of my country, what they are suffering, and that, you know, some of us who were in, 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 in the, you know, had invested and who had been invested on to get to a place where we could um, have platforms and where we could be the voice, we are here in exile. So I think it, um, it just is uh, difficult to exist um, in exile, and I believe it's a form of violence uh, in, uh, that women uh, go through, a political violence. Um, in terms of what's happening back home, Ambassador, I think as I'm sitting right now here, I'm worried that the Taliban are cooking another um, you know, edict that will... I don't really know what is left for them to take away from women except their own being and existence. Uh, but I do understand that every day since the fall has brought, the fall of Afghanistan has brought a steady um, flow of bad news, um, especially for women. Women right now cannot uh, go to school, women cannot attend university, women cannot appear in public spaces, in parks and, you know, uh, workplaces. A woman can't even travel by themselves beyond a certain uh, parameter that is being um, uh, put uh, as a rule for them without having a male chaperone with them. So imagining myself back home sometimes feels like a and I, I was there the day Taliban came. Uh, 
I've navigated those very streets. I have walked those very streets. Um, I have sat on those very tables that they sit today. Uh, I see them. I saw the picture of their current deputy minister who sits in my office, um, the office that I put together. Because when I part of institution building is that you also make to make sure that you make these offices, you know, prof professional. And when I walked to my office in the Ministry of Commerce, you know, I looked at it and I said. I don't think I want to work here, you know, I want to change, there's a lot I want to change about this office. So I changed my desk, I changed the look of the office, I painted the walls, and now guess who gets to sit in that office? Uh, a Talib member um, who I'm not really sure is capable of understanding the ABC of go governance, but who gets to sit there and, uh, you know, enjoy that space that I created. It's really a very, very terrible time uh, in Afghanistan for women. And as Mukadessa said, there is every effort being made to erase women, the face of women in Afghanistan, and every single aspect of their lives is being regulated in the most horrific ways. So I'm sure we want everybody here to continue to do the advocacy, keep women's the women of Afghanistan still um, on the front pages or in any other way we can make it make the situation there public because we do a favor to the Taliban when we don't. This panel's not just about peace building and um, the role that is played in societies by women, but about women's leadership. And both of you are leaders in extraordinary ways. Could you say a little bit about how you see leadership, how it was manifested in your situation, what you were up against, how you uh, exemplified that or tried to act on it? I think it's all about daring to make change. I was the first woman to run the women ministry in 1998. And like you, the first two weeks at the ministry, I said, oh, well, I'm going to change this proverb, Cambodian proverb that says, men are gold and women are just a white piece of cloth. Oh, wow. A white piece of cloth, can you imagine? If it is stained, it is stained forever. If the woman is beaten, she's a bad woman. If she's sold, she's, she deserves it, et cetera, et cetera. With the women's movement, because I came from the uh, NGO civil society, I led the women's movement for peace, marching for free and fair elections. We changed it to, men, you can be gold, but we are precious gems. Neri <laughs> Ratana. Anyway, so I think it's about daring to make change and the hardest change to make, you know, is against your own cultural, social values, which imposed on you what you can do and what you cannot do. You see me wearing my Cambodian, my traditional outfit. I would rather be wearing pants, but my society says you can't. But I make that choice today to wear my traditional outfit in a global stage. This is a world stage. Just to make the uh, point that Cambodia, the struggle of women in Cambodia, democracy in Cambodia cannot be forgotten. You cannot just think about Ukraine today and think about Myanmar tomorrow and think about Hong Kong again. No, you have to think about the whole thing democracy and human rights, and the fight for freedom, the fight for dignity, the fight for respect, especially for women. You have to think about it all together. So that is the first point I want to make, which is about change. The second point is about being transformative, change, but transformative type of change. Meaning that what we know, the struggle that we have gone through, we have to share. We cannot cry in pain, in silent. That silent in pain, the 
pain in silence is negative pain. You have to move it toward positive pain. It's like positive peace. Positive pain is to cry out loud together. Vital voices. This is what we are. And to be also be like water, like what the Hong Kongers are saying. Be water. If the water f hits a, a mountain or a rock, the water, the flow of the water or the river doesn't stop at the rock. It can stop, but it eats away the rock. Or it finds another way to move, find another path. That's being creative and dare to be creative. Specifically, I think, because this is the digital world, it is important, and we are doing it at this moment, Kim Hun and I and other women, we are the diaspora, Cambodian diasporas. We have the freedom to speak. I have a microphone here. In Cambodia, if you have a microphone, you say one word, you are in jail for up to three years. I have to go to jail. I, if I go to Cambodia, I'll be in jail for 42 years. I want to go to Cambodia, but they won't let me go to Cambodia. Anyway, but it doesn't stop there. We have to fight from outside. But fighting from outside has to be connected with the fight inside. So every Saturday on, on weekend, we Zoom. We use Zoom. We use our signal to train the female candidates inside Cambodia, because four months from now, there will be elections again. And we want free, fair, and just elections, where women from opposition from anywhere can run and be safe to run. And me, doing Zoom with women who can hardly read and write, you can't imagine. But they can do Zoom. We spend hours telling them, you see that little, little picture that looks like a camera? Push it. Oh, you see that little picture that looks like a microphone? Push it. It takes hours, but finally, now we are training women inside Cambodia to learn, to, uh, first of all, about themselves. Why is it important to be in politics? Why is it important to be local and then vital voices? And to make it that, ch that change comes from women women as candidates and women in elections, in free and fair elections. That's what I am pushing, we are pushing for. Luka Desta, do you wanna follow up on leadership? Yeah, I, I think leadership is making choices and also choosing your battles and being able to prioritize which battle do you want to fight. Um, and I say this because the context w from which Shafiqa and I come from, again, you know, I emphasize a lot because I know we are unfortunately, as Afghan women, we are too often, you know, perceived as victims of war only and or there are cer certain cultural connotations that employs that you know Afghan women that's how it runs in their culture so I always emphasize on that to make sure that everybody understands you know that you need to look at it it's very nuanced and you need to look at it based on the context uh, and the background um, that we come from and you, you need to see them as an outcome of the socio-political, you know, challenges that they had to go through and navigate on a daily basis. Um, and just to maybe illustrate that a little further, I want to give you an example of um, uh, how I was perceived by my male colleagues um, as a woman leader. So again, you know, five years of Taliban regime, the war before that, women were vulnerable women got affected by it more women were removed you know even for the sake of quote unquote protection from the society so by the time we decided to come in you know it was difficult for people to accept that women could be leaders um, 
for a very long time, they first of all thought that, uh, okay, well, this is a foreign agenda because there's an international community presence here in Afghanistan and there's a uh, global war on terrorism. Um, there's a justification of quote unquote saving the Afghan woman. So this is part of a foreign agenda. You know, they're putting women forward in cabinet, they're putting women forward um, in the government. So, you know, we'll deal with them. Just let's treat them as aliens. And then they started realizing, no, these women actually have brains, you know, they can say things, they challenge us. So, but but this doesn't make sense because we were told, you know, women do not have brains. Women can't really get things done. Women cannot exercise leadership. So, and this became evident to me when I had a group of men that I had trained with me who would move from one workplace to the next. And I climbed up the ladder pretty quickly because... You know, I, I walked in into ministries and I got the job done, right? Um, so, and that, that's what, how, and of course, I made a lot of enemies and I moved quickly um, the ladder. And I, the first thing I realized was that I needed um, the protection of a group of men around me. Um, it was a tough choice to make. You know, it it's... It, in this context, it could also be patronizing to other women, right? But in my context, um, my driver, uh, the two, three security guards who are always with me, I had to train them. And I had to make sure, I had to do double, triple the effort for them to know me more personally than my male colleagues would do. Because I used to sit in my car, you know, they could be a threat to me. My security guards could share information on me, you know. So I always had to go the extra mile in making sure that they are more personally connected with me. I don't think any of my male colleagues went that extra mile of making sure because, you know, they took it for granted that their driver and their security guards were loyal to them. But for me, it wasn't. So the last workplace that I moved on to... Um, there was this one other aspect of having this group of men, quote unquote, protect you, because they were the ones who would who would define the narratives about you. Um, because narratives would start going around about somebody who would walk into a workplace from here, from you know the um, support staff going all the way up. Um, so it was important for me what type of a reputation was, you know, created for me. Um, so the last workplace that I went to, my driver, um, first or second day, I was going home and he was driving me, it was late at night, and he said, Deputy Minister, um, they were asking us today, um, how is she? Uh, you know, how did you guys end up working for her? Why are you moving with her constantly? You know, how, where does all this loyalty come from? <laughs> And then I said, okay, so what did you say? And he said, I told them, now you have to um, take a note of this. She said, I told them, she is a manly woman. <laughs> you don't mess with her. And I just didn't know how to react at that point because his definition of me as a manly woman was patronizing and condescending to, to every woman, including myself. But in that context, it made sense for me. I said, okay, good, if this is what works, let it work, right? That was not my battle, again, going back to choosing your battles. In that moment, my battle was not to train my driver on the connotation and the patronizing and the condescending and this and that. Right? I needed that protection. And the fact that he said, don't mess with her, that's what I needed. <laughs> you know, And then it would transfer from here. Once the drivers and the security guards had that conversation, it will go around to all the ministry. Then people didn't dare to mess with me. People didn't even know where that came from. right? But I had plotted my drivers to say that because that's what I needed to go around. My woman card, I've used it because it was tough. 
it was so tough. You know, I couldn't just walk in everywhere and say, oh, you know, I am the, the woman leader. Please don't call me. My male deputy ministers and I, the three of us, there were two male deputy ministers and there was me. And we had to go um, into meetings. Their cars were just passed by the security checks. But when it came to me, they stopped my car because they wanted to harass me. They wanted to take a look. Oh, there's a woman inside the car. She's a deputy minister. Let's harass her. You know, let's just ask her questions. Nobody would ask my male colleagues for their IDs. They would just pass by. They were deputy ministers. But they would stop me. And uh, just because they wanted to take a look inside the car, who is this woman? Um, and, you know, and all my male colleagues knew that. They knew that none of the male deputy ministers would get stopped, but I was. And then I would take out my woman card. Uh, and then, you know, I would say, what's going on? And my um, male colleagues, I, I trained them to say this. And then they would take out their head and say, there's a woman inside the car. By woman, they meant, you know, this was like in a very, like, protection sense. There's a woman inside the car, so you don't want to take a look inside. Let us pass through. They never said there's a deputy minister inside the car. It was tough for me to exist in those moments where I saw that these connotations were patronizing, right? But I had to choose my battles. And when I, and, and it was tough. I couldn't, I couldn't you know, start arguing in all of those moments. If my security guards could say she's a woman and it would get me through easier than them saying she's a deputy minister, I'm a woman. Poor woman, let her go through. Right, the deputy minister and me would then deal with everybody once I was inside the meeting. So, so for me, I think, yeah, I think leadership is very context-based. Leadership is about choosing your battles. Leadership is also about making choice and exercising agency. And agency, I always say this, agency doesn't always, in the short term or right away, translate to well-being. And it doesn't have to. Sometimes it's only about surviving, but as long as you're making that choice to survive, it might not right away mean well-being for you or for the woman or men of the globe in general. But if it makes you survive, then that's what you should do. So we can imagine ourselves in these circumstances. You know, Mukadesa, listening to you, I remember um, meeting a very young woman who decided that she would um, try to be mayor in a small town in Afghanistan one with tremendous problems, huge challenges that no normal person probably would take on. And the men were extremely hostile to her. Except things began to change and get better, and life was improving. And the only thing they could call her was Mr. Mayor. And so somehow having a skill set that men don't want to recognize uh, can't be accommodated completely. You have to have that Mr. in front of you. Anyway, I thought we could take audience questions, but I'm getting all kinds of signals. <coughs> I have allergies, so bear with me. But I, I just maybe ask each of you in the minute or so we have left, one sentence, what would you advise um, our audience in terms of what they can do uh, to make a difference? Just one sentence each, Some a guideline. Um, this is my favorite one, so thank you for asking. I didn't even know. <laughs> I um, too often I ha too often the woman of my country has been viewed as intervenable objects and as victims of the war. I if there's one thing I want each person in this room um, to do is to first of all challenge um, their narratives of how they perceive women elsewhere, um, and also to do not um, extend their conception of emancipation and freedom to women of the other countries. Um, 
to take a more nuanced approach, uh, you know, to the type of work that they are doing, whether it's development, whether it's uh, supporting women leader elsewhere. I think always try to view other women as agents in their own rights. Thank you. The stop sign is staring at me, so very quickly, Sakua. Very quickly, please tweet. Now, what I am saying, because if I tweet, I have family back home. They'd be put in prison. And I'm not safe here if I tweet those words, but I still tweet a few. But you can tweet everything that we said here, please do, to give us that voice, that women who are in that part of the, our world cannot say the words that they wish to say that makes a whole lot of difference in the way men run the world. Tweet. <laughs> and there you have it. So let's please thank um, Mukadesa Yurish and Musakua for their extraordinary leadership and all that they continue to do to make the world a better place. Thank you both. Thank you.